Okay, welcome everybody to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. The topic of today's lecture six is parallel programming with OpenMP. So we will go into the shared memory programming and we'll basically see a little bit a difference of programming um, what we had done with MPI, basically distributed memory. And of course, we will combine them. We will have a look on this. But before we go into the material of lecture six, let us review what we had the last time. And this was really a practical lecture based on the material of lecture five. We learned a lot of different ideas about MPI communicators. And we had several different data structures derived MPI data types. And here, one example of the hierarchical data format, which is really often used together with NetCDF in parallel I.O. using MPI. So when we review a little bit what was happening then in the practical lecture 5.1, we see that essentially nearest neighbor communication in MPI codes is incredibly often um, used. And for that, of course, we have a specific Cartesian communicator that we learned already in lecture five, but that we then really explored in a practical lecture much more um, basically on a real application example that you also should in turn then, of course, use in your assignment. So we see we use essentially the typical MPI environment to initiate. We have our MPI com world communicator with the processes of all processes um, that we have available to the MPI environment. And what we do, similar as we have done with splitting the communicator or other things, we basically could do here the MPI card create based on this communicator and then have to specify, of course, the dimensions of what you want to simulate, let's say four by four, the ocean of your assignment, maybe. We learned a little bit about the periodics. So what happens if we reach the end of the ocean, so to speak? Do we come back to the other side of the ocean, which is often used in basically physical codes? I'll show you an example later with a wave propagation in OpenMP, but essentially then here, also in MPI codes, this is incredibly often used. And here, this variable then has our Cartesian communicator in. Uh, the reorder shows us a little bit about how much we want to reuse or re reorder the ranks, really. And basically, the interesting thing is, of course, now we can use the rank identity still, but have them basically oriented into the Cartesian grid structure. And this can be quite useful because in a way, if you want to do something like a shift or wave propagation, as we basically have also in the assignment or a movement of a ship from one tile to another, you would basically do this maybe up, down, right, leftwards. It really depends, of course, on the application domain problem or what you want essentially to simulate. And you see here, we see card coordinates. You always get an interesting set of coordinates back that we then also can reuse in different aspects. We have our Cartesian grid, which gives us a little bit guidance. However, we learned also when we use something like essentially MPI communication, we always need the real ranks, right? And how should I know which rank essentially my up or down or left and right neighbor has? This is a good question. And so essentially, um, this is the idea of getting this by just trying to shift. And by doing so, you essentially then get the ranks that you need for your up, down, left, and right, as we have seen the last time. And the idea is then that you, of course, not have shifted yet. You just know what would be the ranks for this, right? What would be your neighbors for this that you can then use in some MPI communication um, along the way that we had also basically had the last time. And of course, in your assignment, this code uh, should be a little bit extended. Um, basically, you could just start with the right set of code with the MP um, Cartesian 2D, for instance, and then basically step by step integrate the ships, step by step uh, do maybe then also the fishing part as it is written in the assignment. Now, the second part of the lecture was then more focused on the data side itself. So where do we store data? And the MPI derived data types I basically have demonstrated a lot. And we will come back to basically many different examples also of the parallel I.O. formats uh, later when we have the application examples in this course. One already that we will start here um, exploring a bit more deeper 
very soon is also then about clustering. And we had already a small look into this um, when we said we have essentially here the inner city of Bremen as a point cloud. So laser scans from a car shooting out lasers and basically getting then the reflections and basically collecting then a huge point cloud. But essentially this would be not a city. So basically you have to really cluster it to get these buildings back together. Otherwise you have a huge cloud of points and have no idea what it is. You see, we also add some colorings to it to make it a bit, let's say, more realistic based on the heights and so on. Um, the interesting thing is now that, of course, here we learned last time, we have not only two different versions, Bremen small and Bremen large, which you see here already on the sizes, which also, of course, then determines the runtime and maybe also the amount of processors you should use for them. We also learned that essentially in H5, you read and right into it right so it's not only a reading format to get all the point clouds out we basically want to have the coordinates that's clear for all the different point cloud members but what we also want to have then is to write the cluster ids back right once we have done and performed this clustering we really want to have the results also in this file and this is a typical use of these kind of um, parallel file formats we have seen with HD5, H5 dump, we can look a little bit into this, but also here um, you see we basically use then this H5 file together in the job script to specify then for the HPDB scan, which of those data sets we want to use. Um, and this basically is something which is really common in many different application examples. What you have not only in machine learning and data sciences, also in simulation sciences, HDF5, NetCDF are really very important file formats. Hence, we will come back to them every now and then in part of this lecture, especially in the application areas. So, so much for the last lecture, which was really a practical lecture. Um, then we need to leave a little bit the world of MPI. And this is for a good reason. And this reflects essentially the idea of going away from distributed memory back to something called shared memory. Of course, this is loaded. Um, it means also capacity limits. You can imagine that memory is limited. And we have seen in the distributed memory example, the idea was really using distributed memory to really simulate large scale systems. And if you just, you know, do shared memory, which means inside the memory, you share the memory, we will come to that. Then you have automatically, of course, capacity problems. So this is not to say that OpenMP and shared memory is basically either or with MPI against, let's say, shared memory. It's rather the idea also to combining them. Hence, we have a lecture following these number six, which is called hybrid programming, where we'll see how we can combine the OpenMP with MPI. And this in a very powerful manner. These hybrid codes, as they are called, are quite powerful, but of course are also let's say error prone and have load imbalance and it's not so easy and straightforward to program. Hence, we spend a complete lecture on it and always come back also to our data science example because we will learn today that also OpenMP is part of it, not only MPI as we had the last time. And basically with this example, we can then also demonstrate nicely the hybrid programming example that we implemented. So the outline of today is then really starting essentially again from, from a kind of scratch uh, from, from zero. We had done distributed memory so far. Let us now skip this a little bit for a while, especially in this lecture, and thinking about what would be if we just have, let's say, access to memory all the time. So this is where OpenMP is incredibly useful. Still, we can use it in parallel. We have different threads that can be basically then work on different work entities. There are so-called regions we will learn about. Um, there are certain fork and join constructs uh, in OpenMP, which says a little bit also something about master and worker threads, which we will look at. Um, of course, OpenMP is the really standard for um, basically shared memory programming in high performance computing. And this enables us really with portability. So we look on this, but also on some limits, especially when we look on quantum computing today. And we'll also have here and there some hybrid programming uh, examples that motivate this already. There are several tools like PyComs and Coms that then also tackle much larger data flow and workflows really of task-based 
workflows than just having, let's say, a smaller shared memory program. But these are also advanced topics already. Just show you basically also the ideas of what few, few further topics are there really in shared memory programming. When we want to then basically want to do it ourselves step by step, um, we basically will learn the basic building blocks of how to do an OpenMP application. And like in MPI, we will start really from scratch. We have a typical C program and then basically go there step by step of saying, what have we do, to do to actually then parallelize an OpenMP? And this is a bit different than you already know from MPI. So here we're looking at um, different local and shared variable types. We have an interesting approach of parallelization of loops, which means you just do a couple of, let's say, edits of your source code and magically OpenMP, so to speak, will parallelize your loop. That's quite convenient. However, of course, this needs to make sense. And when you're then thinking about synchronization methods as part of loops and so on, it can be quite tricky already to really program this in a fashion that there's not much load imbalance, which we also will review performance issues, especially when you think about critical and single regions where only one process can enter or one process all in all will just enter this. So while others basically may be waiting, this is of course performance issues, which also enables us to look a bit broader again and come back to MPI shortly and see what are really the comparisons now with MPI. <clears throat> we have a couple of applications then, um, which are basically the P application approximation already linking to material we will have in lecture 13 when we talk about Monte Carlo methods. But I brought you also simulation science method in the Jacobi application example about the heat dissipation we already had a little bit alluded to and come back also in the hybrid uh, lecture next time. We finish then with the HPDB scan clustering example. This time, of course, we will review a little bit more what we have with essentially OpenMP instead of MPI. <clears throat> so with this, we also fulfill quite a lot of promises here. And especially this is really a complementary part to distributed memory. Again, this is not in competition with each other. This is rather thinking about a smart combination. So as so a learning outcomes here, of course, you will learn uh, to work with scalable networks and data intensive workflows. Data, because this always, when it's nicely parallelizable, always is an indicator, for instance, going through loops and so on, that this could be quite useful for OpenMP to parallelize. Um, you will see with critical regions and so on that we have already quite some complex aspects of parallel programming covered and enables you really to, to go one step more of then combining MPI with OpenMP, making it hybrid. And this is really one of the most complex aspects of parallel programming these days. Of course, you can add now the accelerators, which we will also have in subsequent lectures with GPUs, which then adds another level of complexity. But of course, with hybrid MPI and OpenMP combined, you will already realize that it's getting more complex and more complex. However, your assignments will remain, let's say, to a moderate degree for the credits here of the course. Um, but still, it gives you the possibility, for instance, in projects or basically when you continue to a PhD, to have all the basically basics know to go really sophisticated in codes. So this is really HPC programming um, as it is in, in practice every day in the large centers around Europe, around US and everywhere in the world. So this is an interesting approach. Take away the message that basically you see a lot of Fortran also. And we will come to this when we come to some of the application examples. Uh, many of the CFD codes, for instance, and solvers are written in Fortran. And there is a kind of real community behind this that we will look in basically when we come to the CFD lectures that Fortran is still existing. However, in this course, we focus a little bit on C programming, uh, but still we give you also some Fortran examples because it has still relevance really in, in programming paradigms implemented in all the applications today. So let's come to shared memory programming concepts. So a bit more high level introduction, starting from what we know already from the first part, basically in lecture one, we learned that shared memory has essentially um, the idea that you see here on the right hand side, you have some type of RAM, uh, 
and it doesn't matter in the moment which type exactly important is it is shared across all the different threads. So this means um, you basically can write variables, read variables, and this all the time to the shared memory. You have basically directly access to memory. Hence, it's not any more distributed memory where we have to send message exchanges. Here, you really have direct access via variables towards these different spaces. So the spaces here in green, the address space of this memory, as it is called, and you see here some different flavors of it. We will review a little bit again. So some would say this is a uniform memory access. So basically you see here that the memory and the CPU have all the same way, if you want, or distance to the memory. However, here you see in a way it's a distributed memory, but through a specific bus interconnect, this still is like basically a kind of shared memory construct. So basically, you don't see this. The address space will be automatically adjusted. Um, and this is the called non-uniform memory access. You will see and notice that we change here also the, the kind of um, idea how this is called. So the name are usually always in shared memory threads, while we talk in distributed memory with MPI about processes, right, that run on the different cores. And these ty two types of varieties is, is, is good to know. And you can imagine when we basically don't have any more directly here the access um, basically to the memory, there's this cache coherence problem where you essentially have then the problem to really ensure when another a CPU basically want to write to a distant memory, this bus has not only enabled the addr address space to be connected, but basically also has some, you know, cache coherence protocols so that the memory is still in order and there's a single shared view on this, although it's here kind of faked because it's distributed, but on, only distributed in a very small scale manner, not across a whole HPC machine. The threads are really lightweight um, processes. Um, this is a really much lower, um, let's say, um, overhead for all the operating systems to actually work with threads. And when we here now look a little bit more into a shared memory with UMA, um, uniform memory access, you see again, you have essentially the memory and the whole chipset, what you have here from the different processors have the different levels of caches, which is good, and then can access the memory. And this also shows you why we're so interested in shared memory. You remember it's very fast, right? So um, compared to the caches, it's of course comparatively slow, but memory is still much more faster to work on it than, you know, disks and so on. That's why, of course, we want to leverage this. So distributed memory combining with shared memory then would mean we really can maybe get the most out of the memory. We can fine tune the memory usage. And this is the idea of UMA, but we also have CC NUMA, as you understand this non-uniform, uh, which has really this cache coherence basically between it that you see here. Again, the situation is quite similar, except basically you have here another, let's say, memory interface, which ensures that all have a single coherent view on the memory, no matter if it's actually essentially distributed, but basically the link and the bus here will ensure that actually you as a programmer don't really know that, right? The link will ensure this. It's physically distributed, but a logically single as an address space. And this is an interesting approach, enables of course also then high performance and makes it a bit easier to program when basically this co coherence is already there. So you see also memory can have different forms, varieties, how they look like, cards, um, basically, and different forms. It doesn't matter here in this particular lecture, we will watch more thinking about programming those, no matter what type of memory it is. The, the first kind of terminology then that we basically have towards this is shared address space. And here is a good question, what is actually this? And this is an interesting explanation here, maybe where you see you have some shared data you want to have in the kind of shared address space. And then you have your private data from the different threads, right? And of course, this is basically something which you see here going then, it goes here over the wire in CC NUMA. Although, as we know, that's kind of 
not known to us, but still that would mean it is shared among all the processors, this local access to memory. And basically this enables quite a nice thing that, you know, first of all, you would have some private data that you can have, but then also share data, which means one thread can really communicate with another through the use of the shared address space here. So it's a basically a simple example of a thread communication if you want. And uh, there's basically a set of compiler directives that makes this all uh, possible um, in order to do, for instance, what you see here, thread one is then, you know, having some data, putting that into some variable that is also known by thread two. And then he can just use that and basically does this work on it and add a one here as an example. And this essentially looks then like this over the wire, depending, of course, on if you have, let's say, UMA or CC NUMA. But this is, uh, of course, very similar than in the type of programming. So the interesting thing is really it's without explicit um, message exchanges, this communication, right? This is very important. You have communication, but we don't see it. You know, in MPI, we would have sent and maybe something like a receive or so. But here you just basically work with all variables. And we will see how that materialized when we look through the whole lecture today more and more into detail into the OpenMP specification at the second part of the course. So what is OpenMP? It's kind of a standard really with an API that is very strong and actually evolving quite a lot. Um, it's not that everything is focusing only on distributed computing because we now have lots of lots of cores and scale up to millions of cores. No, we also still use shared memory and fine tune applications in this regards. This is basically a serial code, but the only thing we do is we basically have compiler directives that mark parallel regions. And with this comes essentially also scalability because you mark them essentially without really the need of a fixed thread number size. So you can essentially during the application development program that in a fashion where you say, no matter how many threads I will have available, this loop should be paralyzed. And there's some, let's say, different approaches to this. One of them is using the thread number in the batch script for submission. And then via environment variables, this will be kind of known to the environment in OpenMP. We will see some examples. Still, it's a typical C program, right? So we still have to compile. We still have to introduce a header, which has the OpenMP uh, specification. And uh, we should really get the terms right. And this is a typical exam question, right? When I talk about OpenMP, it's important to notice that threads are the entity for work sharing, not any more processes, because they share address spaces. And where, of course, all the variables are, the data, the, the, the arrays that we want to look at. And still they are working in parallel, can be synchronized and are very lightweight processes. And basically what we want to learn is also how we can spawn them um, basically to really um, uh, have less costs to just have the processes. Um, basically because you have this shared address space, a variable space together, and the whole management of the operating system is much more lightweight when you have essentially threads. Um, a good indicator for using this is usually independent computing. That is basically a good point then to really think about, okay, OpenMP can be used, but of course you can also communicate via the variable. So in a way you can also think about uh, some form of dependence. And this is what we see then in the OMS when you have the workflows and so on, the larger ones where you then have dependency, one task needs to be finished before the other one and things like that. So the important terminology is, is incredibly important to, to know by heart, especially for the exam. And also when you later talk with the experts, um, they always think about threats when it's about OpenMP. Um, and then basically um, the OpenMP threat is something which is then managed by this OpenMP runtime. The interesting thing is that there's this so-called master threat you see here that is always existing. This will, will always live with us. And it's a little bit like rank zero, if you remember from the MPI world, you need someone who is then saying, okay, do more things in parallel or do something. But here we do a fork of really saying now and spawning from this master thread, uh, 
here in this example, five new threads. We do this with a so-called parallel region. However, what you also notice is that a complete OpenMP program needs to be not parallelized completely. You also can say after a certain amount of parallel computing, we go back with a join and have a zero region again. And then basically have another team of threads joined and, and basically and another fork and another join. So that means you have a typical serial C code and the OpenMP program in the end is just a couple of parallel regions. I mean, just as a good statement, you will see that this can becomes more and more complicated the more you want to do with it. And what you do in C and C++ is usually you indicate this with so-called pragma directives, right? That you would say, now I want to do something with basically OpenMP in parallel. But of course, still the same goes for Fortran. You have just a simple different type of initiating this. But uh, this is the same way how you do it with OpenMP. You always mark these parallel regions with a specific directive. So when we look at this, how that would look like from the more execution level, we see here the master thread, as I said, is always there. Um, it is always basically alive and goes through all of this. And then basically in all the different parallel regions, it's on us to really spawn then different threads. But the master thread ensures that, of course, the whole application is living basically um, until the proper execution finishes. We see some other aspects like fork and join. We already have said that actually shut down all the parallel region elements, which means the team of threads is then reduced again to the master thread, as you've seen here in this and this part. Um, also, when you see about the parallel region, you see the Pragma directive here is a very good example, Pragma OP parallel. So basically here, this is executed in serial because it's not really indicated as a compiler directive. But then we have here a good example that, for instance, is Billy, which is one uh, procedure will be then four times executed here because it's a parallel region. But as soon as we basically close this parallel region, we join back and have not any more four threads, but only the master thread who is then again implemented basically then this daisy and doing it in serial again. So the number of threads can be really different in each of the different parallel regions. You see this also nicely. And there are, of course, lots of fine tuning methods we were not really able to cover in this lecture because it's just an introduction lecture uh, here that we have take away the message that in Jülich and other centers around the world, we maybe do three to five days from morning till evening, just open MP. Right. And this is, of course, now leading also to the use of accelerators with open ECK. And, and, and accelerators is, of course, the next re real big thing. So then you need to learn also about them. So you see kind of the combination of all of that for a practical application is then really where the complexity comes. I mentioned this OpenMP is a standard and enables portability, which is really good and, of course, helps the HPC community significantly to advance in the scientific applications which means if you maybe computed first, maybe somewhere in Barcelona, then with basically using the OpenMP library, you can move your code to Jülich, for example, or to Italy and Chineca or other HPC machines around the world here in Iceland, maybe Gapur or Next machines. And the idea is really to use the same source code and this works more or less quite nicely. So in MPI, this works also quite okay. Of course, the performance itself, again, from the application is not directly portable. It still depends what type of CPU you have, how much memory you have, right? Now think about shared memory means we're using memory and the memory space and the architecture of these systems here as a whole play a huge role now how we can exploit shared memory. And, and this also includes not only the architecture, as you know from the beginning uh, that we had here, um, it's always for basic building blocks. We have the theory, technology, architectures, and software. So also OpenMP, the software enables us now to leverage this shared memory, but it doesn't help us if we have almost no shared memory or no memory capacity available. Then the whole software doesn't help us. So we need technology to follow suit. You will also see that in the end, RAM has to be filled. And we basically have some theory and theoretical limits we can achieve by filling the memory or by doing this 
workloads so on a bigger scale maybe with gpus where the bottleneck essentially is not only computing anymore it's more the capacity or the throughput to fill the data in in all of the let's say device memories on gpus and the host memory basically from the cpu that you need in order to fill the device memory is usually of the GPUs. So in this sense, um, this is a very good example. Of course, it has limits of portability. If you think of now what we do in the next um, decades now, we already started to exploit basically quantum computers. Here's one example from the wave systems we work with. For instance, in our research for quantum annealing, when we really do, let's say, machine learning on support vector machines and remote sensing, you will hear something about that. Basically, when we come to our invited lectures here from Gabriel Cavallaro and Rocco Sedona, it's upcoming in this lecture series. When we already know a little bit more about GPUs, when we know a little bit more about machine learning and data mining. But the key point to take away is this is a complete different approach to program. We have qubits instead of normal bits. We have an ocean basically API and software development kit we can work with. So there's no open MP directly on it. So this means a new era of computing really. However, still it's good to do work in open MP because essentially a quantum computer will also never really be completely, at least in the next decade, really exchange a system of HPC. We still need the number crunches of really CPUs and especially GPUs you can consider a quantum computer rather than something like a GPU or something accelerating specific topics. One good example is optimization problems, which is inherently very good solvable with quantum annealing, for instance. So you would use the general HPC machine and then would outsource, let's say, a couple of your code problems from the optimization perspective to the quantum annealer. It will come back with the examples and then you continue your application basically on the normal HPC machine. Hence, again, the comb combined use is here what makes the complexity for application developers these days, not only OpenMP, because OpenMP itself is straightforward. But once you combine it then with MPI, you combine it maybe with CUDA, with accelerators, and then want to maybe do some offloading of the optimization topics to a quantum annealer, then you get the message that as an application developer, it's getting more and more complicated. And that's what we face today. HPC programming is extremely complicated, but of course also very rewarding because you're always at cutting edge of performance speed. So when we now think about hierarchical um, hybrid computers here, I don't need to spend so much time. We had this already in lecture one. Uh, and what I just told was you that course combine this today, right? So you would say um, you have kind of this shared memory space that you have here, but you have still a larger communication network. And this is, means not the network I showed you for the CC NUMA to bring it together. This is really the idea then using it for distributed memory, as you remember, OpenMP largely within the nodes here, and then MPI across the nodes. And that's essentially um, where you basically are today. Um, so it looks a little bit like this. and. Um, there are lots of different techniques you can imagine, but don't use MPI then inside the node, right? This usually makes absolutely no sense because you would be always slower than just reusing directly the memory space. So this this is, a, of course, a hint where MPI not belongs. MPI belongs more here for inter-node communication. Another hint, um, we have seen already lots of MPI examples. You see here praise tutorials I put here for you as a reference, especially because OpenMP will be just not really a complete tutorial. You see there are lots of different aspects to it, lots of different tutorials possible, much more information if you're really seriously interested to use it. I would say that praise tutorials are very, very good to start from this material, much more deeper than we could here in the HPC University course. Now, let's reflect this a bit from, from really programming these hybrid systems. As I said, there will be a complete lecture seven coming up. So we go with this a bit quicker and then come back in lecture seven for it. Again, think about MPI, distribute memory, you send messages, send, receive, our collectors we have learned, right? Reduce operations. In shared memory, you have threads, 
and all of them can actually get access to the shared memory. And if you then combine it, the idea is to send then basically messages between them for the data that end up, of course, in the memory of the different processors in the green space here. And then you can have an inherent communication within the node. But once you have limit in memory capacity, you go between the nodes and then have different processes. You communicate with it. So this is an important part that you so should know, learn by heart. So this would be something how it would look like. You would have here the shared memory nodes. And then with MPI over the network, you go to the distributed node um, and the distributed memory. You put the variable here. And then, of course, here with OpenMP, you can then access all the shared memory and then can use MPI further again for internode communication. So that is pretty straightforward. However, if you want to implement this um, and then working in it, you see here now one of our scaling plots of the application that you by now know a little bit already. This clustering we had talked about too, right, of points. You see here nicely, and we do it in parallel. Here with four threads, for instance. And you see essentially when you hear hybrid and just MPI, um, with just MPI, we are not as good as actually doing it hybrid. Of course, it's clear. We can actually get more fine tuning out still. It is also something which is, you know, linear scaling, which you not really can achieve the higher you go. Um, and these are different data sets, data set one and data set two. Then, of course, the more challenges will come and it will probably give this a tail off here at some point in time. So in the end, it scales better. Um, and standalone MMP is basically also possible, but they have, of course, the limits of the memory they have to think about. Um, and you have to specify more elements now. We basically see a much more fine-grained idea of number per task per node that we want in each node, where because we have four threads we want to execute there. So what this will be all shown when we have a practical example on this, uh, based in one of the practical lectures coming up. Just to say that it has relationships to GPUs these days. Um, we will have a complete lecture on GPUs. That's why I will not talk too much about it also today in OpenMP. But of course, there are links also where you can use OpenMP and the main memory here. Now also smart together with the device memory and with this also with the accelerators, right? Um, we will talk about this a little bit. These are just ideas basically where in the moment the research is where the, in the kind of evolution of basically OpenMP comes from. And OMS is just one example of it, um, where you see here OMS is a framework for, you know, task wise handling of data. Um, you see here that over time, really, the OpenMP specification was enriched with things coming or elements coming really out of OMS. And you see this is really task oriented, right? So thinking more about what tasks we can paralyze and what happens if there are multi dependencies, right? So dependencies, task loops, maybe something like a whole tree, a kind of full workflow of tasks. And this is where the research is also today and basically then informing also the new standards where we are today. Uh, you see here also the involvement from now working seamlessly more and more together with devices or with the GPU I mentioned. You have here basically the host memory where you have one output. You still have to download the output from the device memory. We will learn about this in our lecture nine when we talk about GPUs. And then in the GPU device memory are things and the threads basically parallel working here six times. So six basically parallel ideas how this is actually um, computed. And, and this shows you that there's a lot of work around this. Um, OpenMP is really a standard where people build on. And you see here is the OMS programming model example. Uh, which is really an advanced example here. It doesn't matter, but it shows you that th these complex task dependencies can be also nicely parallelized with this program, a pragma statement about OMP tasks, uh, where you have a much more task-wise orientation. You have basically different elements of parallelization here um, as an example. Also here, task dependencies, you see this very nicely when you maybe break up such a tree to a more perspective on which of the different actually nodes or cores is now running in the different threads. So this is something to understand. 
So this gives you lots of flexibility to really extremely fine tune your application. And, and it's also a much more a way of thinking data instead of just compute, right? Um, in MPI, this is maybe also the case, of course, because you distribute data to be computed in parallel. But of course, in OpenMP, it's a bit more obvious because you directly work on shared memory constructs. Right, and here this comes super scalar just to really, um, you know, conclude on this examples and really think about that there's even movement to PyComs. So using Python together with this approach is of course something which is very modern and more and more people start really using this, which are nothing else than Python bindings for this comms. And it's really an interesting programming model that is a bit more coarse grained on top of shared memory aspects so that you have um, essentially an idea of, uh, of the bigger picture and then the inherent parallelization will be then performed by this kind of, um, yeah, by this environment. And not only shared memory, you can then also go across, let's say, different systems, you can go to cloud environments, but this is all would be a lecture on its own. So I provide you here some references to more information, just that you know that, of course, the world is moving in shared memory, the world is moving around also of thinking bigger in terms of uh, essentially also using different codes, different systems. At the end of the first part of the lecture six, I brought you a little bit um, what is similar to the, um, yeah, basically the assignment two, where you basically not expected to deliver this, what you just see now. Here you see essentially a computational fluid dynamics code using OpenMP with many different threads, and you essentially have the wave propagation we talked about. It's a typical scientific application. Liquid flow follows specific, you know, kind of laws in physics, so known physical laws, and this is based on a numerical method, and you can nicely parallelize this with lots of different OpenMP threads. Of course, then the ocean is limited, the space, because essentially this means it needs to be memory available to making it bigger, right? And then maybe model a ship on it, and then maybe model an oil platform on it, and then maybe go more fine-grained into storms, into fishing nets. And suddenly you see the more you, of course, add it in this kind of basic scientific application example here, the more realistic it gets, but also the computational demand will explode. Only if you have some obstacle somewhere in a liquid flow is already something which creates turbulence, uh, maybe when the waves are high. So this is really computational expensive CFD codes. We will also come back to this when we have the CFD applications, basically then in later parts of the lectures where Pedro and basically also Reza, they will basically give you some examples out of our simulation lab CFD, um, what interesting examples they have uh, which can be really quickly grow computationally expensive. So it's requiring HPC. Now, but coming back to OpenMP, then in the second part of the lecture, after a short break, we'll be showing you how you can do and do your baby stacks in OpenMP. So we break here for 10 minutes and see you in the second part of the lecture. <laughs>